Hi everybody, it's Katie, back with another episode of my vlog. And today is Sunday, so it's time for the Cinema Club Sunday Roundup, of course. Um, this was another short week for us. We've been really um, invested in our shows. We've been watching Heidi, Girl of the Alps, and Dark on Netflix. Um, both totally recommended still, um, but also no review until we're totally done with those. Um, so we only actually watched three movies this week. We kicked off the week with Dirty Harry. I told you guys last week that since the kids finally completed the Dollars trilogy, they're now qualified to watch Dirty Harry. Um, so we went ahead and watched that one. Uh, of course, Dirty Harry from 1971, starring Clint Eastwood as Harry Callahan, a cop working for the San Francisco Police Department, um, who has to track down and stop the uh, serial killer Scorpio, who is based on the real-life Zodiac killer, who was um, terrorizing the San Francisco Bay Area a few years before the movie came out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, what to say about Dirty Harry? It's a great movie. Um, it's a classic um, action, adventure, cop, drama. Um, and Dirty Harry is kind of, uh, I don't know if he's the original loose cannon cop who, like, doesn't do what his superiors tell him to, but he's pretty much the model for it. Um, and Clint Eastwood plays him incredibly well. Um, there's multiple scenes where he's having to deal with his superiors and like he just gives them a look to describe how he's feeling and it's just perfect. Um, the movie is incredible. I love it all the way around. I love the writing. I love the directing. I love the story. I love the setting. As you guys know, I grew up in Berkeley in the 70s and 80s. Um, my grandparents lived in Marin. My parents both worked in San Francisco. Um, we were all over the Bay Area a ton as a kid. And of course, um, I was born about five years after this movie came out. And so the visual landscape of Dirty Harry is very much the visual landscape of my childhood memory of the Bay Area, if that makes sense. Um, of course, anyone who grew up in the Bay Area or spent time in San Francisco in the 70s instantly gets nostalgic for it when they watch Dirty Harry. Um, the climactic end scene of the movie where Scorpio takes the bus full of kids on the uh, the drive along Sir Francis Drake Drive in um, Marin and they go past the uh, the, the, the bridge that Harry jumps off of and then they wind up with a climactic scene at the quarry. That was literally the drive to my grandparents' house when I was a kid. So like we went under that bridge that Harry jumps off of on the way to their house and past the quarry um, every time. So it, it always makes me think of that, um, which is just funny, you know. Um, but it's incredible. It's an incredible movie. Um, the one downside that I will say is the camera work is pretty... Uh, and it's really dark. I don't mean thematically, I mean like visually dark. There are a bunch of scenes that take place at night. There are a bunch of scenes that take place in various dark places. And it is so poorly lit. There is just a ton of screen time where you're literally looking at a black screen and you're like, what's going on? I'm hearing a noise, but I can't tell what these actors are doing. Um, so, and you know, I get it. They were shooting on the budget they had and they made the movie they could at the time. But it's one of those things where every time I watch the movie, I just go, oh God, I wish you guys had lit this just a little bit better. Um, because I'm sure there's visual information there that uh, we could use, but uh, we don't have it. So um, that's the one downside of Dirty Harry. Also, it's interesting to watch the movie. Um, ooh, it's warm in here, sorry. Um, it's interesting to watch the movie nearly 50 years after it came out and think about what it was like when it came out. Like I said, this was kind of like one of the earlier uh, loose cannon cop movies that then gets replicated and copied and built on the idea of over the next 50 years. Um, and so I'm sure Harry Callahan felt very out of line and very out of control in 1971 when this came out. Um, watching it through a 2020 lens, um, you know, having seen sort of how much more extreme uh, loose cannon cops in movies can get and how much more extreme serial killers portrayed on screen have gotten over the last 50 years, it actually feels kind of tame. There's still a few very crucial scenes that are like, whoa, ah. um, but it's it's interesting to kind of think about the impact of it 
then when it came out versus what it feels like to watch it as a 2020 audience member. Um, the other thing is, <laughs> you know, I'm sure when it first came out, Dirty Harry's gun, the uh, 44 Magnum, seemed like this just gigantic gun for a cop to have. And by today's standards, it just didn't seem that big. It was funny. We, uh, we went into it, Henry had, you know, had a little foreknowledge of what the movie was and what the character was before we went in. And he commented afterwards, he was like, I, I don't know, I expected the gun to be bigger. Um, and again, I'm sure it was for 1971 audiences. Um, but in the, you know, 2020 viewership of having seen everybody with the biggest guns of all time in every cop movie for the last however long, and, and the actual cops on the streets beating up protesters having bigger guns than that. Um, that's another topic for another day though. Uh, but Dirty Harry, fantastic movie. I love it. Um, I could watch it a million times. Uh, I'm so excited that we now opened this door up because that means we get to watch the other four Dirty Harry movies. Um, like any franchise or movie that has a whole bunch of sequels, they start to, you know, slide downhill over time. But the first couple of sequels are pretty dang good. I think, uh, Magnum Force is the second movie in the series. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Jake Kelly, who loves to correct me, just watched all of the Dirty Harry movies, so he's going to know. I'm pretty sure it's Magnum Force, though. Um, so I'm probably going to recommend that to the kids this week if they want to continue in the mode of Dirty Harry. Um, and then speaking of continuing, continuing with our Western Wednesday Sergio Leone uh, Spaghetti Western theme, we finally watched Once Upon a Time in the West, which is his film from 1968. Um, starring Henry Fonda as a bad guy, which is so unexpected, and he is so evil and scary in this movie. It's pretty ridiculous, um, and he does a great job at it. Um, you've also got Charles Bronson playing uh, Henry Fonda's uh, enemy in the movie, who's out to get him. Um, Jason Robards as a bandit named Cheyenne. He does an incredible job in that role, and uh, Claudia Cardinale, the Italian actress uh, plays actually the lead of the movie. Um, she is this homesteader. Uh, her name is Jill. She's like an ex whore from New Orleans who's come out west uh, to marry this guy. Or I guess she already married him back in New Orleans, but she comes out and they're about to have a wedding. And Henry Fonda's gang shows up and kills him and his kids on their wedding day when she shows up. That's like her introduction into the movie. So it's pretty intense. It's pretty dark. It has some pretty heavy themes to it. Um, I would say it's the darkest of all four of those, uh, the Leone Spaghetti Westerns. Um, it's incredible. It's also slower than the other ones. And I have talked about the other ones being slow. This one is even slower. It has a lot of scenes that have no dialogue, um, that are just that, uh, that great Leone camera direction, um, you know, close ups on people's faces or silent action going on that tells you the story without the dialogue. Um, really incredibly well done. Uh, I don't want to say too much about the plot and the central conflicts of the story because as usual, you know, I like to recommend a movie and have you guys just go have the movie tell you its own story instead of having me tell you the story of the movie. Um, I did learn in my research that Leone actually attempted to retire from making Westerns after he finished The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. He was like, okay, I'm done with that. I want to try some other stuff. Um, and unfortunately he had done such a good job with his Westerns that he couldn't get the budget to make other movies and Paramount came along and, uh, you know, basically made him an offer he couldn't refuse for, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. So he went ahead and made that movie because he got such a huge budget and he had all these stars that he could choose from. Um, and, and it's an incredible movie, but it definitely feels different, uh, than the other three. And apparently he did it because he was trying to make Once Upon a Time in America, which is his great gangster movie starring uh, Robert De Niro, and I think James Caan is in that one, um, which is totally recommended. Um, apparently he wanted to make Once Upon a Time in America first, and he actually had to make Once Upon a Time in the West um, first in order to kind of get permission and get the budget and get the studios to agree to let him do uh, Once Upon a Time in America. So didn't know about that. Um, also, apparently Henry Fonda originally, when he was offered the role, turned it down. And then Leone flew to New York, I think, and went and met with him. And he was like, hear me out. You got a shot of a gunslinger from the waist down. You see him draw his gun and shoot a child. And then the camera pans up and you see 
it's Henry Fonda. Like he's, he's never played a bad guy in a movie up till now. Um, and he's incredible. Like I said, he's very effectively scary as this character, Frank in Once Upon a Time in America. So um, another long one, we split it up into two pieces, watched it over two nights. Um, but again, highly recommended if you are interested in Westerns, if you're interested in Leone's work, um, you've got another score by Ennio Morricone. So that's great. Um, all around incredible movie, uh, you know, two thumbs way up from over here. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, again, it is a little bit more mature and a little bit heavier than the other ones, I think. So if you've got younger kids, maybe give this one a pass um, until they're a little older. Or if you're like us and you're like, you know, we can watch anything, but we got to talk about it and talk about what that thing meant. Um, you know, uh, go ahead. Parental discretion is advised, I guess, is what I'm trying to say there. Um... So that concludes the four in a row Leone movies. Uh, and next week, or I should say this week for Western Wednesday, we are going to watch The Wild Bunch, which I'm super excited about. Again, I, you guys know I love Westerns and I'm showing the kids some of my absolute favorites to begin with. Uh, and The Wild Bunch is just such a total classic. It's a great one. If you haven't seen it, watch it on Wednesday with us. Uh, that's the program. Um, and the third movie we watched this week uh, was Sean's pick the other night. And I said, what do you want to watch? And he was like, I want to show the kids something weird that they've never seen. And I was like, go for it. What, what, what is it? And he pulled up Ninja Scroll, the anime from 1993. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this one. I don't know if you guys are fans of anime. This is definitely on the more adult end of the anime spectrum. It is very bloody. It is very violent. Um, and it's pretty perverted. There's a couple different rape scenes in it that are, I don't know, you know, like Japanese culturally are kind of generally more perverted than Americans. And Sean pointed out, we're trying to paint a picture of how bad these guys are. And so that's kind of why they might put a rape scene in there. Um, but you know, the older I get, the less I want to sit through a rape scene in a movie. I'm just going to be honest. Um, I don't feel like it's the greatest plot device. I feel like, you know, what did Leone say about his movie? Oh, let's let's set the tone for how bad this bad guy is by showing him murdering a child. I don't know why I'd prefer to see someone murder a child than a rape scene, but um, I guess I would. So that, that's something that I learned about myself today. Okay. Um, so again, there's a couple of moments in Ninja Scroll that definitely would make me say, mature audiences, you know, let's call it PG-13. Or, you know, if we were in England, it would be like 15 plus or something to see this movie. Um, but again, if your kids are used to watching stuff like that or able to handle it and have a conversation about it with you, um, go for it. Uh, the animation style in this movie is amazing. Um, all the characters kind of like really pointy looking, um, if that makes sense. I also really felt like, if you guys watch Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, it felt like a, a, like a predecessor to Jojo's Bizarre Adventure in a lot of ways to me. Um, it's really cool. It's like there's this um, mercenary swordsman who he's going up against this group of ninjas and they all have like um, supernatural powers and can do different things. And one of the characters is this lady that's covered with tattoos and her tattoos come to life and attack the other characters at one point. So of course the kids are like, oh, mom, what if you could like, like, take a knife off your arm and stab somebody with it or send, you know, that spider or that snake after your enemies. And I was like, that would be a pretty cool power to be able to like pluck my tattoos off my body, have them come to life and be my minions who go do my bidding. I'm, you know, three kids, there's a lot of discussion of like, what's your fantasy superpower if you could have one? And we're kind of always going back and forth on what they could be. But tattoos come to life and do your bidding. That's a pretty good one, I'm gonna say. Um, so, uh, again, I don't want to say too much about the plot. If you are into anime, especially anime that's geared more towards adults, um, you know, think Akira, think Ghost in the Shell, um, films like that, um, you are going to love Ninja Scroll. It is really, um, well paced, well written again, minus the rapey parts. Um, and the animation is really cool. I really, really dug the character designs and some of the concepts for the superpowers that the bad guys have. Um, so check that one out if you are into any of the things that I just mentioned. Um, and 
that's it. Those are the three movies that we watched this week. As usual, I would love to hear about whatever movies you guys watched this last week or any plans you have for movies coming up next week. Like I said, we're going to be watching The Wild Bunch on Wednesday and probably Magnum Force or whichever is the second Dirty Harry movie, if I don't have that right. Um, and I am not sure what else, but I know Henry already revealed he's picking more episodes of Dark tonight for what we're watching tonight. So you guys might want to check that one out too. It's pretty great and pretty weird and pretty exciting and intriguing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it here. Um, as usual, thank you so much for watching. I will be back in a few more days with another episode of my vlog. Until then, take care and stay safe out there. And again, thanks for watching.